welcome. This is um, welcome. I'm so glad you could come this evening and spend some time with me. I'm Tilly Strauss. I'm an artist, an art coach. I've been a teacher for 26 years, and I'm now a town clerk in my community. And um, this is a series I've been working on called Who Is She? It's about um, famous forgotten women. I had been a little bit disappointed in the lack of women I've learned about art women in history. And I was a history major too in college. And so I started looking into it and then I couldn't really, I would, there are hundreds of women in history. They just aren't in our history books. So I ended up reading about them and then forgetting about them. And then I decided the best way to learn about something is to take it all in. And for me, I read, do a lot of research, then I write, and then I make a little zine, like a magazine layout, and I do these presentations. The best way to learn is to like share what you've learned with somebody else. So I took this idea to Bibiana of the Inspiration Art Christian Group, and she like was like, sure, let's do it. So this is how I got here. And thank you to the Inspiration Arts Group for this platform. I really appreciate that, um, to share this with you guys. And um, Bibiana, thanks again. You're like my accountability coach, making me show up. These are very fast um, series. I do one a month, and this is the eighth one I've done this year. It's been a tremendous pace. Pretty much as soon as I'm done with the talk, I start researching the next artist, and um, I have to gather the pictures. I have to write, do the writing, and then I do a layout of a zine. And I just got the Dora Mar zine um, done from last the last months. So I get send them out and get them printed. But anyway, let's talk about Gwen John. You want to change? There, there it is. So Gwen John is actually she was Welsh, um, born in Haverford West in um, Wales, and they didn't spend they w didn't spend a lot of time there. Her memories are mostly of Tenby, which is on the coast, and that's where she kind of ran wild. Her childhood was not a happy childhood. Her mother, I put a picture of her mother's tombstone there, sort of, it's to remind me that her mother died when um, she was eight, but had been suffering so many illnesses and everything that basically Gwen was motherless from the age of three. And her father, who was descended from working class, was trying everything he could do to not seem like he was descended from working class. So he was very, he was very obsessed with social appearances and it, it, told that he was very cold. Um, so after her mother was gone, there was a series of nannies and uh, they the two mean aunts that came through. Anyway, it, it wasn't a happy time. A lot that we know about Gwen too um, has been sort of lost. I wanted to show this map that she spends most of her life in France. And You'll hear, you know, she does an incredible daring um, trek across the western side of France, and then she spends her life um, outside or in Paris. She's kind of overshadowed by her really famous brother, Augustus John, and he's a society painter, and the, the two are very close. He was two years younger than her, and um, they did a lot of art and drawing together in their childhood, but he's able to go off sooner than she is. So another thing is that we know that Gwen John had um, an affair with uh, um, Rodin. She modeled for him and he pretty much slept with all of his models. And But they had a 10-year relationship. Most of that after the initial passion was through letter writing and she writes really pleading letters to um, August. And that is how, if any of you women artists out there want, are interested in being part of history and everything, I suggest that you write letters because that is undeniable proof that you existed, especially Rodin actually preserved all of her letters. And, um, and she also wrote to a girlfriend, Ursula Tewitt, a lot. So when I'm writing, when I'm researching these, I'm not really like this presentation isn't going to be a lot of um, critique about the artwork itself so much, but it's I'm more interested in my research about um, the circumstances of their life and who were their allies and where they found the strength to persevere against like all odds and and what possibly um, contributed to them sort of being erased from art history. So let's go. Okay, her education. Basically, 
Um, Gwen went to school on and off sporadically. The father didn't really, couldn't really control her. She, till she was 15. And at that point it was decided it was enough schooling for her. So she basically learned reading, writing, arithmetic, and French. And she also learned to the comportment of a lady. From this time on, really, she never goes anywhere without a hat. You'll see, she always has a hat. These drawings up here are done by her brother, Augustus John, who was an incredible draftsman. And they're etchings and drawings in a watercolor done by him. And that's his self-portrait. Well, Augustus got, when she was 15 and giving up school, Augustus got sent to prep school where he took some art lessons. And when he came back, he convinced his father he wanted to go to the Slade, which was a new, somewhat progressive art school in London. And off he went. Um, and he started writing, you know, um, his sister, telling her she should come too. Well, now... What I know about Gwen at this point in her life, we don't know a lot. None of her art really survives from before she was 19. But from 15 to 19, she's just mulling around the house angry at her father. She's embarrassed. He's trying to find a, a future wife among one of her friends. She wants anything to get away from him. And finally, she persuades him to let her go to the Slade as well, follow her brother. And he agrees, but only he's only going to pay for her tuition, nothing else. So she's got to figure out her, her room and board and everything else, but she's finally allowed to go. The Slade is a, is progressive in that it's the only school in Britain that allows women, but it's not, it's still old school. And you, the women don't have completely nude models. Um, the men will wear, if there's a man, they'll wear a loincloth. And if there's a nakedish, nakedish model in the classroom, the professor will stay out of the room. And at a certain point, the model covers herself up. The professor comes in and all the female students leave the room and he makes notes on their work. This is a drawing um, of Gwen with one of her professors. And he's making notes right there. Um, we believe that's Professor Brown, who will later, he's he's a he's a good supporter of her. Down at the bottom is a is a drawing of Ida Nettle, Nettleship, and she was Gwen's best friend. And the two of them will get up to a lot of mischief. And I, part of this news story coming out about Gwen, there's a, a show in Ch Chichester, England, right now at the Pallant House. It's that she wasn't a recluse. She was actually very well socially. Um, connected, especially, you know, as her brother rises to fame, she's also in Rodin's circle, you know, she's very well connected. And so we'll talk about uh, some of some of her, her girlfriends who help her out. So this is one of her earliest paintings. She does this when she's 19. And this is here because it's Tenby. It's a landscape. She doesn't do too many of these. And she actually wins an award for this because it's, um, figures, you know, a multiple figure composition, which is kind of strange because she doesn't really um, do fi figures like this, but it's great. And in this series, let me just say, she's painting with um, oil paint on canvas and it's like washes that she she's learned to use the glazing technique. Oh, you know, at that 10 B, I wanted to say too, between her first year at the Slade, can we go back? I'm sorry. She, they go home for the summer and her brother Augustus has an accident. He, he's diving off the cliffs and he hits his head on a rock and Gwen saves him, brings him back. But after that, he's never quite the same. And it's, it's an accident that totally changes him. And from then on, he's a wild bohemian. He has long hair. He has a gold earring. And he's still prize winning with his work. He's winning, like, he won, like, all the prizes at the Slade. And Gwen won a lot of the, the prizes the year after him. You know, she would win the same prizes. But he was magnificently popular and seemed to be able to do anything. And the teachers all loved him. And um, anyway, and he comes back and he's also seducing women, like, like it's no end. He can't meet a woman that he won't sleep with. And later in life, it's rumored that he has like a hundred illegitimate children. <clears throat> he always pats, if he passes a child, he pats them on the head. He said to, do, because he never knew if they, they might be his. So it's, you know, he's, he's really kind of crazy. Um, Gwen actually starts to avoid his company. So now we can switch to the next slide. And 
after her her year, she and and um, and Ida Nettleship and and Gwen Salmond, another Gwen, all go to Paris and decide to rent a flat together. And Ida's going to go to the Colorosi Academy. We've heard about this with other artists um, that we've covered in this series. And Gwen was, the two Gwens were thinking of going to the Academy Julien, but they heard about this Academy Carmen. And this is done, this was opened by one of James Whistler's uh, models. And he's agreed to come and teach two days a week. So they go and enroll then. And I put one of Whistler's painting there. Whistler's the one who painted um, what we call Whistler's grandmother. But it's actually um, arrangement in gray and black number one. So he, um, yeah. So he teaches her that basically everything is about tone. And you mix your whole palette ahead of time from, you know, and the values and everything lined up. And um, it she and you make notations and this is the back one of um gwen's watercolors and you can see the notations on it the numbers she developed a system that nobody art historians can't figure out and it definitely at the time really frustrated her brother who was fascinated he was possibly sometimes jealous of of her paintings that she could do and he was known to kind of steal one away to study it but anyway so she becomes, oh, and another thing is Augustus is good friends with Whistler and he will, he will run into Whistler at one point and say, hey, what do you think about my sister's paintings? Aren't they, they've got character, right? And Whistler draws himself up and says, character, what's that? Your sister has tone. So that's really, you know, from now on, she'll start painting with these dabs of colors and less of that washy look. Okay, you can change the slide. Thank you. I just wanted to put up, um, these are three self-portraits that she's done um, of herself. And you can see that she's her best model, actually, probably for lack of um, any money. But she was also very interested in fashion and clothing. And every night, Gwen and Gwen and Ida would get together and create all these clothes. Um, they would sew and they buy old clothes and rip them up. And do. And she apparently designed um, her address out of one of from one of Manet's paintings, and wore it when her father came for one of his rare visits to come and talk about the allowance. And as she met him at this restaurant and was about to sit down, he said. She looked in that dress like a prostitute. And she said, well, with an attitude like, I cannot, I cannot take any of your money. And she left. And after that, it got a bit stringent. She had incredible pride. She, I think she only saw her father maybe once or twice after that incident. But clothes are very important to her. And I just wanted to mention that um, during the World War I, she, her Ursula Tyrwitt, her girlfriend in London, will send her care packages with clothes in them. And that's what Gwen gets most excited about in her letters. But without any money, she has to take up modeling for other artists. So, and she isn't doing that well. She has to go back to London. So that ends the whole Paris thing for a while. She goes back to London and it's pretty much uh, sad. She calls it her subterranean period. There's a picture there of um, her brother, Augustus, who is now married to Ida. Um, he, she, she wrote sometimes that she thought he would take everything that was hers, you know? So here's a portrait of her next to with Ida in the middle and one of Augustus's um, sons. And she had fallen in love with one of Augustus's best friends and he didn't take the cue and got engaged to somebody else. So she was, she was depressed and living in basements, basically living on um, peanuts and um, nuts and, and fruit. That was all that they could afford at the time. She had friends that tried to help her, but she, it, it was disastrous. And after this, she pretty much decides that she's always going to have, um, money for her own apartment. This is also when she first sort of adopts a cat and she'll have cats for the rest of her life. She's she's often homeless with cats for company. And she wants to be alone, actually. She likes it that way. She does go to these parties of, that all the artists are throwing and they are helping her. She lives sometimes in a group home with people. But because a woman alone in this time, I just wanted to say too, I have a whole thing on my zine about it. 
they're looked at as really suspicious, you know, and um, mistrusted. I mean, it's, it's a break in the social fabric to be alone. And so when she would have a place alone, the, even the landlords and stuff would, would cat call her or hiss or, and if she, if she was followed home and scared, but the people would say you had it coming, you know, it was, it was a hard time um, to be alone. So she was pretty strong about that, but she did go to parties. So and it was at one of these parties <clears throat> that she meets this Dorothy McNeil, who they, you know, changes her name um, to Dorelia. And she's in stunning beauty. This, are, this is a, a painting that Gwen has done of her and a drawing. And she became a model for Gwen in exchange for her own painting lessons. Gwen tried as long as possible to keep her from her brother, but <clears throat> the inevitable happened. And he, he wants, he, you know, he wants to, Dorelia to save her friendship with, you know, the marriage of her best friend, Ida. She comes up with this plan out of the blue. Let's go walk across France. I'll teach you to paint, Dorelia. You carry my art supplies and we'll, we'll, we'll sing for some teams. We'll, we'll paint in the bars. We'll do portraits. We'll sleep under the stars. We'll do this whole thing. Her brother tries to talk her out of it. And the two women are like, no, we're going to do this. So they plan to walk across France, take a boat to France and walk 620 miles. So it's pretty, it, it's pretty fascinating. Um, they get it to the Bordeaux and at Bordeaux, um, they follow the river Garonne inland. So they're going against the tide because the Garonne is flowing towards the sea and they're walking from the sea in and down south. The walk is way more, I did a little drawing here what I thought of um, Gwen walking and Dorelia sort of hunched over with the paint boxes and the paint supplies. And um, there are letters of, and stories about that Dorelia tells later. But basically, this this walk is to escape escape her brother and you know possibly save his marriage to Ida, but it becomes a, like a break from her childhood, and it's just amazing how brave Gwen is doing this thing, because doing something like women were not allowed out of the house really. They had domestic duties. They had things. To, they weren't even allowed in like pubs. And you you'll recall Suzanne Valadon risked everything and didn't really care. And she could be in the pubs in Paris. It's the same time frame. Whereas um, an artist like um, Berta Morisot or Mary Cassatt, they stayed home because they had they had aris an aristocratic bearing and upbringing, and they had a reputation. And not only their reputation, but if you did something like this, you besmirched the whole bloodline, like the whole bloodline. So women were you, but you know what? Did Gwen care at this point? She's not talking to her father. She has no mother. She's escaping her brother. I don't think she cared about her breadline. So that was something she was had. From now on, she just loves um, sleeping out in the in the under the stars. And even when she's living in Paris, she's known to take a ferry south um, and go and and sleep out in the country or take long walks. She's a real walker. And then at, at the Luxembourg Garden in Paris, they locked the gates at night. She would sometimes sneak in there before the gates got locked. And so she could sleep under the bushes and she felt kind of safe, um, safer that way. But they make it to Toulouse, 150 miles, which is, and the story of that is, is amazing. There's a, a woman who's written um, Windswept, Annabelle Abbs, a book, Walking the Paths of Trailblazing Women. And she, Gwen John is chapter three. Anyway, they uh, they um, make it to Toulouse, and apparently Gwen is really inspired painting a lot of Dorelia, like that that one that's called the Student, where Dorelia is standing and it's all in grays and browns. She paints that there, and then Dorelia kind of leaves for another man for a second, and. Someone tells her that I think that same man tells Gwen, you know, you could go to Paris and you could model and make some money. So Gwen heads to Paris and she gets there in 1904, which we found a few of the women we've talked about in this series have been in Paris in 1904. So these little drawings I kind of reused at the top, you have um, Rilke and Rodin. Um, 
So Gwen, and that is a portrait, a self-portrait of Gwen. And look how confident and strong she is. She rents a couple rooms um, in the Montpar Mont Montparnasse district neighborhood, um, cheap, um, unfurnished places. She adopts a cat that she names um, after the street. And when she goes, she's modeling for some women. And when her brother suggests she should go meet Rodin and model for Rodin, she goes there. And that begins um, a, um, a huge event in her life because after the attendance and everybody leave at the end of the day, Rodin, who's been working with Clay and having her naked there, will light candles. And that's apparently when the first kiss happened. And the two of them have this mad sexual relationship for a while. It turns out that it, she arrived just when Rodin was being commissioned to make a monument to James Whistler, Gwen's old teacher. Um, and he decides he doesn't want to do a portrait of Whistler. He wants to do the muse. The muse look, you know, on the stone of Whistler's tomb. And he needs somebody to hold this pose that's athletic. And she is. She's just come back from this 150-mile walk. So she's she's athletic. She's willing. She can hold a pose. And um, so they're, they're perfectly made for each other. Can you change the slide? We know... Um, that these this is a portrait that she Gwen has painted of Rodin, a watercolor, and then that's a self-portrait, and then that's the muse that he sculpted. He never quite said it was finished, but um, there were, you know, it went on for, for months and years, actually. Anyway, there were, we know a lot about this relationship because I mentioned earlier the letters that she would write between her and Rodin. She was very graphic in them. She was definitely not a prude. She talked about the squirrel in his pants. But what I think is very interesting here is her decision to stay single. That by, by being with, he was practically married. He was with Rose Beret for his whole life. And he does end up marrying Rose later. But by being with a man, and she's 27, he's 63, she's avoiding getting a domestic situation going on, and she can keep her independent spirit. At this point, all of her girlfriends, except Ursula from the Slade, have gotten married and are no longer making artwork. So this is something that she definitely, it's obvious to her, and she wants to have a career in the arts. So... Rodin starts to plan, plans her days, tells her what she should do, encourages her to read. Remember, she only had a short time of reading. And um, in one year, she writes him over a thousand letters. So it's pretty, it, those are pretty amazing to see. So, uh, and this is, yeah, these are two of her early pieces that she starts to do. This is a trademark of Gwen John's work is basically um, a, a lone female figure. It's about solitude, but they're they're not frightful or timid, and they're not enticing you to come in the room. They're um, and they're also tiny. They're like six by seven inches, and they will get smaller. They usually have an open window nearby, a book. You can see a cat, a cat in the chair, and a cat on the wall behind them. Um, and it's basically tranquil, and yet preoccupied, I would say, for these pieces. And they're about, you know, they're sort of what the role women sort of do. I don't know how they appealed to other women at the time, but Gwen would work on these for a long time and she didn't really give them up. So, But I wanted to also t mention that she had this support group of friends because she's first, when she first arrived in Paris, she's modeling with friends. So Hilda Flodin is a Finnish model who's also one of Rodin's models, and um, she posed for Hilda. Um, Ellen Lee is a woman who, um, she does a portrait that's actually in the Tate right now. Miss O'Donnell was an artist who worked for Rodin and actually is the one who takes the clay model of the muse, the little maquette, and is actually chiseling it out of marble, really um, making it big. It, it was her, Miss O'Donnell, that did that. Um, but so she's so so Gwen's having to pose for Miss O'Donnell for that thing. And then Miss Hart, who gives Gwen 
a set of kitchenware. Gwen at this point had no kitchenware. She was, she must have had a little pot, saucepan because she was living on chestnuts boiled in milk and um, saying that it had everything you needed. Well, it actually, she was getting very weak. She was falling apart. She would, she would use her um, lack of eating too sometimes as a threat to Rodin. But these women one time rented a cottage in the summer and whisked Gwen away to nurture her back to health. They told her she was there to like model for them, but they basically were feeding her food. And this is one of the few times that Gwen writes in her letters about a whole meal that she had. Um, I think she wrote about two of them. It's the only two times that she really talks about food in a positive way. But, but these women were there for her. And I wanted to throw that in, that that's, that's something. Uh, and you know, cats and nuns too. She's um, daily. She would draw her cats. She was, she would drive Rodin nuts because she was always roaming the city and feeding stray cats. And and what would happen is when she, where she'd live, she'd find that somebody with a dog or somebody being cruel to an animal, she would register complaints, especially against dog owners. And um, and the whole neighborhood would start to hate her. I mean, they were suspicious of her. Here she was, a single lady all by herself, you know? Um, so Rodin would constantly kind of have to help her move. She also would, would follow at a certain point, Rodin would no longer allow her in the studio. And so she, she couldn't get past the secretary and he would give her assignments and say, I meet you at a certain date at three o'clock at, at your place, you know, but she would wait outside his studio and follow him to mass. And by just doing that for a while, apparently the it got to her, all the, the religion, the music, the sustenance. And she became very involved with the Sisters of Charity. And she liked the starch headdresses. She wrote about that and the ribbons. And she became um, friends of the mother of this place. And they commissioned her to paint um, the foundress, Mère Puspin who lived from 1653 to 1744. And you can see from the dates I put on there, 1915 to 1920, those are the dates that Gwen actually took to paint the paintings. She worked for six years on them and she did several pictures, smaller pictures. She used some of the other young nuns to pose for it. And this was just a long running thing. And it was a reason too for her to hang out there, you know, at the church. Um, at the at the Ch Sisters of Charity place. You can see the one on the table on the far right, the little dabs of paint. She's putting down dabs of paint. And if if she gets anything wrong, she puts the painting aside and doesn't finish it. So nothing, that's one of the problems with getting things finished. Um, there's a lot of unfinished works that something just didn't register for her and she, she changes it. But, all right. Yeah. These are beautiful. These pieces are from her um, uh, time in like after the war. These got very, very popular because they're called the Convalescent Series. But, you know, I was just thinking that they are, um, they're beautiful. Um, it'd be really nice to see a full whole show of them. And they're kind of these women lost in thought. And this is also deep into her letter writing time. Between 1906 and 1907, Rodin isn't even in Paris. He's gone away. And that's when she writes these three times a day letters. He saves them. Her handwriting changes at this time too. It becomes very much more childlike and childish. And she starts writing to a pseudo person named Julie, sending them to Rodin, but writing to an imaginary friend, Julie, because Rodin apparently at one point was so bored with her letters. He said, you don't tell me anything interesting. And she said she'd be embarrassed to tell him, you know, the daily stuff that she does. And he said, try. And so she can do it by writing to Julie. These letters describe how she's, you know, when she gets a complaint, you know, and sees somebody mishandling a dog or a cat and all these little trivia things we were getting from these, these letters that she wrote to Julie via Rodin. And then she's also become a really good friends with Rilke, who is um, Rainier Maria Rilke. He's for a brief time, he's Rodin's secretary. And he's often the one that has to tell her she's, he's not here. You can't see her, see him. So, but they get very close too. 
his friends. And you know him, he married Clara Westoff, who was um, Paula Moderson Becker's best friend. So here are a series of her self-portraits. And I just think it's interesting how she grows in this sort of poise and self-confidence. And the last one, 1907, I feel like she's she's um, more wispy and washed away, but it's definitely a limited range of tone. She's hold, clutching a letter. It's these are these are who she is at these different stages of her life. Uh, yeah. So she has food issues. Um, I brought up a little bit. I didn't tell you how she convinced her father that she had to go to the Slade. She went on a hunger strike and refused to eat until he got scared and, and uh, sent her there. And while she was at the Slade, they hardly ate. And I told you fruit and nuts in Paris is chestnuts and boiled uh, milk. She tells Rodin his letters that if he doesn't come see her, she's going to stop eating. And basically, she she's giving the food to the cats. One thing early in her childhood that you read in Augustus writes a book called Chiaroscuro and covers his childhood. And he said that um, Gwen hated rice pudding and the meals with his father would be, you had to be completely silent. There was silent, no kids allowed to talk. And she was forced to eat the rice pudding like over and over again. And so there was a battle of sorts going on about food then. So this is just something that I would find interesting to look into later, you know, if somebody wants to. A great thing happens in 1910, um, Quinn, John Quinn, he's a Wall Street lawyer. And Augustus is doing his portrait and tells him about his sister. And John's kind of interested. So he sends her like 30 pounds and says, send me a picture and doesn't get an answer. So he sends her some more money. And she, if she answers, she says, well, I'll send you something if it's of any good or if I'm not too sick. So it's always promises. And, um, they developed this relationship. He finally goes over the top. It's an interesting way that this relationship developed by refusing to give him work. He wants it more and more and more. He sends her, uh, he starts sending her an allowance, a quarterly allowance so that she can paint, giving him the right to two or three of her paintings and drawings every year to first, first choice. But, um, and he, but in the letters, he also asks about her contemporaries. Has she been to Picasso's studio? Has she seen Brock? Has she? And she tells him about um, Henri Rousseau. And John Quinn actually buys that, the gypsy, the whisper, the, the lion sleeping over the figure, um, the lion standing over the sleeping figure by Moon. I forget the name of it, but he, he actually buys that from Rousseau. She tells him about Modigliana and, and Brancusi, who were sculptors, um, assistants to Rodin that she met while she was posing for Rodin. And um, they argue about frames. She, John Quinn, the pieces are so small, he wants these really elaborate frames put on them. But she says, actually, and it's shocking, that her work would be better unframed. And she wants them hung in groups. But he's really forgiving. In fact, after he's paid her all this money and got nothing, he ends up going to the, around to the convent where he actually buys a painting of um, Mère Pouspin, which is interesting because it's like he already paid for it, but he doesn't say any, you know, he rebuys it. And um, he does get a couple pieces from her, but he starts to want to meet her. And Gwen, and Gwen will go through all sorts of hurdles to avoid him. He writes her, he's in New York, and he, the Armory Show is happening in 1913, and he writes her that he needs a cable. I need three or four pieces, and she cables back one. And so he's okay for that, and that one never shows up. So he ends up donating two of the pieces in the show that he owns, and these are two pieces that he, he owned, um, the girl with the red shawl and the girl reading at the window. And... Um, it's just interesting when I looked into the Armory show, there were like out of something, 350 artists, 50 were women. And actually, so I've started making a list of those women who were showing there. And one is right up the road in Great Barrington and Kathleen McNary. I don't know anything about her. The women, I only knew two of the other ones, um, 
that were in the show. So it was very interesting for me. Um, her brother, Augustus, has like 20 pieces in the show, and he takes New York by storm. He ends up staying in New York for a while, setting up a studio so he can paint all the, the rich people's portraits. And anyway, this was, I just want to say the armory is something we don't even hear about the women that were in it, and it's something to be looked into. The first, when the First World War happens, Gwen, um, people in the country in France are freaking out. They remember a lot about the War of 1870, and there's a lot of trauma in that from what they experienced. So everybody's like leaving. Rodin leaves for Paris, and he takes Rose and Judith Claudel um, to England with him. And she gets the news by deciding to go buy an, a new outfit that she'll keep in the closet for his return, to meet him on his return. And she also picks up this book, um, the biography of um, St. Margaret of Cartona, which really it's, it's about a saint who abandons her wealth and actually starves to death. She goes to the church and is helping with the Sisters of Mercy and in and, and Medon, and she's she reads the Times. Uh, Ursula Terwitt, her friend in England, has sent her a subscription to the Times, so the London Times. So she's reading that to the the wounded Englishmen, and this is not um, the sign of a recluse. I just want to say she does these drawings, and these are drawings kids on the coast, and some of these children, the one and far right, lived long enough to they're still alive and to be interviewed about her just pretty recently and about what was she like? What was Gwen John like? And they always said, you know, she was, might not have been very pretty, but she was a lady and always, you know, comported herself and kind of timid, but she wasn't that timid. She was scavenging in the woods for fuel. And she was also, you know, living now on a liquid diet and getting packages from Ursula Tarwit of clothing that she said were the best thing that she could have. So another next slide. This is okay. They have to get away. She wants to get a, the front is moving close and her and a friend, um, Ruth Mannon and Ruth, Ruth's 10 year old daughter go rent a place up on the Breton coast, which reminds um, Gwen of Tenby, where she grew up swimming in the ocean and she's swimming every day now. And she's working plein air. She's painting the children. This is when she actually starts the convalescent series of 10 paintings. And they became really popular after the, after the war. Um, they're kind of about recovery in a way. But you will see here, you'll see the three-quarter view, no background anymore. She's completely eliminated any background and it's just tones dabbed on. And it, the, the way she puts the paint on, is the mood of the sitter very restrained and and limited you know yeah here's here's two more that i thought were beautiful to look at um these two more she's writes down she's gets very you know she's still going to church and she's using she's saying pray every day and that keeps her a better painter because it keeps her more disciplined. But she's also, um, she knows her own worth too. She says, don't be vague or wavering, impose your style. Let it be simple and strong. Don't be afraid of falling into mediocrity. You never will. So these are also like her most productive years. It's a war, but there's no Rodin. She's not writing him anymore. And she's, you know, reading a lot. And she's planning actually a one person show in New York and that will travel to London. She wants her work hung in groups. She's, um, and then in the middle of the war, right before the end of the war, 1917, she gets news that Rodin has died. She was 27 when they started their relationship and now she's 41. Um, she gets pretty ill. She, ships, uh, you know, puts a bunch of her work in a trunk and sends it to Paris, her studio, where it, the, all of them, all the work disappears. So it's a, it's a, it's a double setback and around, yeah, it's, it's kind of bad. It's so yeah, now it's after the war. And of course, you know, Paris is like the place to be. Um, 
and John Quinn visits a couple times and she makes excuses each time she's out in the country. She says that. And one time she comes back when she's sure he's gone and he has extended his stay and he comes tramping up the steps to her little attic room and they meet and actually they like each other. They have um, fun together or, you know, they have an understanding and he will take her to the to the Equitable Trust Company of New York, which has a, um, a branch of, in Paris. He has to convince the manager that she's a, a real professional artist who works slowly and hardly ever shows. And they allow um, Gwen to have a bank account with John Quinn signing on to it. And this point in her life, she's healthy, she's active. Um, she gets very popular. Ford Maddox comes to interview her for the Transatlantic. Um, John Quinn's telling everybody about her. She goes to Picasso's studio when he buys the three musicians. That's one of the pieces, the Cubist musicians he buys. And um, they go to a party at, at Brock's, at Brancusi's. And um, she's she's getting around. These are her most productive years. Yeah. So I just want to put two more of these in there, that pyramidal, monumental single women with their hands in their laps, sometimes a book and look at, you know, they're looking out at us, but they're also, they got their own feeling, their own um, thoughts going on. And it's like all the action in the piece is somebody said, this is inside their head. We're just looking at the outer stillness. So you can see the dry brush strokes too, you know, at the, she dobs this on. Ah, uh, this is a series of teapots on the table. And I mean, um, they're just, it's, it's with very little, she's just getting her notes. And some of these she probably were considered not finished. She wouldn't send, you know, John had to like rest things out of her hands to let her get, you know, give him a piece. She never thought they were quite good enough. And um, in 1925, John Quinn, who's only 54 years old, he dies suddenly. And it's a real shock. Um, Ursula is the one that tells Gwen. She's pretty distraught by it. I mean, up to this point, she had money because of him and she didn't have to, you mm -hmm. know, she could hire models. She no longer had to mo model herself. And also John Quinn had about 3000 amazing, amazing works of art, which his, he had no real plan for in his will. And so his sister just sort of disperses him quickly. Um, so they kind of got spread out. And that's kind of what happens to a lot of these women artists. Their work isn't put together and donated to a museum that might happen with uh, a, a male artist where a, a collector will have a selection of their work and make sure it's donated or gifted to a museum. And that doesn't happen with these women. They either have to sell their work to sustain their, their life um, income or their, the work is just quickly into different private collectors' hands and never gets it to a museum where art historians can see it and people can see it and it can get into history books. So that's something um, to take into consideration. But at this point, she does have um, um, a one-person show in London at the New Chenille Gallery, and she puts in 12 oil paintings and 50 drawings. It's a huge success. And the prices are high and the work sells. Um, William Rothstein, one of her friends from the Slade, he's now head of the Royal College of Art. And he makes sure that a work goes into the Tate. And which the Tate, when it started, had like it started when she was like 30 years old about 10 years earlier, and they had like 435 works of men and only five works of women. So this is a huge groundbreaking, glass ceiling breaking for her to get work um, put in the tape. And and her, it's her friend's support too. They are, they write, Ursa, Ursula, I think, writes the intro for the catalog and and they and she's got letters that they're saying, hey, of all of us in the group of artists when we were young, you know, you've made it and you've worked the hardest for it. And this is this is really pretty, pretty great. Um, yeah. So she's back in um, Medon, which she has a little flat. And what does she do with all the money that she made from that show? But she buys a little plot of land that has like a little, might have two shacks on it or a garage on stilts, something like that. It's very, 
very abandoned and wild is what everybody calls it. And it's for her cats. And she, first thing she does, she builds a wall around it and a couple stone paths. And then she just lets it go wild. She has one couch inside of it. Um, Ursula comes to the rescue at one point and does bring her um, tables and pots and pans and cups and even a collection of seashells, which Gwen is immensely grateful for. She's, you know, Rilke, her, Rainier Maria Rilke dies. And on, so she's kind of not painting as much anymore, but she goes to church and in church, she's starting to do these pencil sketches from behind of these little kids of the convent. And um, then she takes them home and she'll do watercolor or gouache in them. They're kind of, um, she falls under the influence of Rilke's good friend, who's a Catholic philosopher, um, Jacques Maritain, who has a sister named Vera. And Gwen actually gets pretty obsessed about her. It's an unrequited love. She's writing all these love letters to Vera. And Vera, um, they're like, they're in a wild range of emotions from exultant to despairing. And Vera's like, ends up having to cut her out. But Gwen gives her a whole series, a portfolio of these drawings um, at the end, and Vera just stashes them away. But they have been um, found and sold to, for high, high prices to support the, the Maritain Center in Alsace. So, um, but these are just pieces. A lot of conversation with Vera about whether it was a sin to draw in church or not. And I think Vera said it was okay, as long as she was actually still listening, she could do that. But, and this is, I, I wanted to put in a slide. She didn't live in Paris all the time. She actually bought, rented a place and the land she bought was up in Medon. And this is where um, Rodin had a house too. So she was kind of close to him. She would um, when he was alive and not seeing her, she would sort of sleep in the bushes around the house. One time she ran into Camille Claudel, who was also doing the same thing, you know, and they called Rose mad because Rose would run out of the house sometimes and start beating at the bushes. And they said she was seeing things, but she was seeing the mistresses of um, Rodin out in the bushes. So anyway, this is, these are two scenes that Gwen has painted from her flat and they're, they're interesting because they're unconventional. If she'd have looked out the other window opposite this road with this little figure walking away, she would have seen Paris and the Seine, um, you know, circuitously winding its way. And that was a scene that was almost cliche, even in Gwen's time. So she avoided that. And I think that's interesting. And then you have the, the I could have put a ton more of her nocturnal watercolors. They're just beautiful. But um, there's one there. So, um yeah, so she she died pretty um, suddenly. I was going to say that this um, the pro this is her nephew Edwin, who she leaves everything to. Just two months before she died, um, Maynard Walker, an uh, art dealer in New York City, he had come for the second time. He'd gone earlier to try and get and parked himself on the stairway outside of her part her studio in, in Paris and refused to move until there were 10 paintings he could take. And when he finally got the 10 paintings, he told her to take them to the shipper and um, for the show they were gonna have in, in Manhattan. And of course, um, they never they never made it. Well, she he comes back when he has his own gallery, um, the Maynard Walker Gallery, and tries for five paintings and she will only give him one as a gift. And he goes out to that shed on that cat property and he sees the whole shed is, is full of canvases. And he's, he laments because they're, they're the weather, they're open to the elements of the weather. And some of them are already, you know, mildewed on the back or something. So that was sad. But when Ed, when she dies, Edwin um, goes to the garage and there's, there's nothing in the garage. So who knows where this is? She, World War II happens. This is 1939. The, the country's on the brink of war. Everybody's fleeing again. She goes to the train station and decides she's not going to leave and instead um, feeds her cats, sets them all up, and she takes a train to the Normandy coast, to Dieppe. And when she arrives, she collapses and she dies a, a couple days later and they say it's from starvation. So 
She was living on liquids, she said, before that, because it was less trouble than anything else. So going to the next slide, I just wanted to talk about her legacy was such that, um, you know, her brother, he was going to design a headstone for her and he never got around to it. But he did say in 1946, after she'd been dead a while, that 50 years hence, I shall be remembered only as the brother of Gwen John. And here we are. And I didn't really know either one of them but it has been really interesting for me. And I wanted to share that my sources were Annabelle Abbs, The Windswept, and Suzanne Chitty, who's written a book, Gwen John, that's really good. But also there are some articles um, and the Pallant House in Chichester, England, right now is having a show that's up through October 8th. And that is really inspiring a lot of renegotiations about who Gwen is. And I really, I think that's really awesome. So... One more slide, I think. Yes. Okay, so coming up next is Lois Melu Jones. I don't know anything really about her. But the thing is that, like I was telling you at the beginning, how fast this, this my practice of turning these around every month. And I just, I kind of went behind. I'm just, just got the Dormar one, which was last month's the zine ready here. And I've decided to hold off and do Lois, not in October. I can't do the October 27th date. <clears throat> so I appreciate you hanging in there or maybe coming back in November 22nd is the fourth Wednesday that I'm hoping to be ready with that. And, and the Gwen John zine will be coming soon. So thank you. And thank you for being here. Appreciate that. Thank you for letting me share. Hi. Hey, Christy. Hi, Kim. Hello. Thank you, Tilly. That was amazing. Really, really interesting. I was surprised that her pieces were so small. Yeah. They got smaller. Even the, the church pieces ended up being like two by three inches, you know, very small. The stuff would get smaller and smaller. What was the biggest that she did? I think it was 25 inches. Okay. You no, know, 24 by 25. And it was an early piece that... Um, one of her, I think it was her self-portrait. I'm not sure. So, do you, do you think that could have been because she started out as a poor artist and the cost of canvas and paint and whatever, and that just became her style? I think so. I think so. I think that a lot of it was materials and what you could get. And in fact, during the time when she was really poor in Paris, before John Quinn's help, she was just really working on paper with watercolor. She wasn't doing that many oil paintings at all. Most of her productive years where when Rodin was out of the picture and John Quinn was paying her a stipend and she could, she could actually do, but I think then she was so cautious and so deliberate and meditative about every spot she would put on the canvas that, you know, it was almost pointillism. You, you, you know, and if you've ever tried that, you don't want to do a giant piece. Yeah, you know? They're very contemporary. They're very beautiful. I think. Yeah. yeah. yeah they Thank are. You. Do you Thank I had one question in the the early the first picture you showed of the uh, with the woman and the child in yeah. in, in Tebby. Te Tebby. Um Do you think that could have been a, a self portrait also of? Yeah, you know, because it's her, her mother or. Yeah, I thought so. I thought so myself. The missing mother, or, it's, or definitely a dialogue between a child and its mother, is like the front and center. It really captured a yeah. very realistic uh, child listening. Yeah. At that age, still to their mother, not so much later. But <laughs> yes, exactly. Good point. Very good. Very good point. So, thank you for being there and everything. Oh, Appreciate yeah. it. And um, very, very, very interesting. Thank uh, you. Yeah. All right. So we'll see you next month. Okay. No, not next November. month. I'm gonna yes. take this month off. <laughs> November twenty second. <laughs> we'll be here. Oh gosh, yes. And Lois should be pretty giving, but it'll be worth it. I have a book. I have a book rating for about her, so okay. I'm ready. So, thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. 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 Oh, hi. <laughs>